for the 2022 AGM of Hydrographic Society Scotland branch. Welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us. Um, we will be looking for people to propose and then second motions through the evening. What we need you to do in order to take part in that is to be logged in to your Google account so you can add comments into your YouTube um, comment section, which should be down the right hand side of your page. We are going to start with our AGM and then after the AGM, we have two fantastic presentations from the Ordnance Survey and from the UKHO. But let's start with our AGM. So our agenda will be approval of the previous minutes from 2021. I'll then go through a brief uh, summary of the chairman's report, uh, the treasurer's report, election of our office bearers and committee members, and then any other business. I should point out at this point, you may have noticed I'm not actually the chairman. So Simon couldn't join us tonight and he does send his humble apologies. Um, I'm Nikki, I'm the deputy chair of, um, of this branch. So all the documentation for the AGM was sent out two days ago to our membership. So everybody should have had lots of time to digest the, um, the documents. So we're not going to be showing full reports. We're not going to be showing um, all the minutes, etc. We are hoping that everybody has had time to digest those. So let's have item number one on the agenda, approval of our previous minutes. So as I said, these were circulated um, two or three days ago via email to our membership. Um, now I'm hoping that nobody has any comments or queries on those minutes. And I would like to ask for a motion, please to approve those minutes of the 2021. AGM, please. So we're looking for somebody to put the name forward as a proposer and somebody to put the name forward as a seconder for those minutes. Now I can't see any comments coming through. So if I quickly escape that. Go to my stream yard. I think we have approval and we can move on to the next slide. Right, so again, the chairman's report was sent out in full. Um, so I'm not going to read out the full two or three pages and show you the photographs. Um, I, I hope you've had a chance to read it. So just as a summary, again, another year of you know, minimal face-to-face -face interaction, but we did, manage, uh, we did manage to continue with events through the year. Um, great uh, support as always from our members, corporate members and sponsors throughout the year. We did have some movement on the committee, um, but we are standing now at uh, 22 uh, members going into 2022, quite appropriate. So we started off Q1 um, by running three joint events with our Norwegian friends, the Norwegian Offshore Survey and Positioning Forum. Um, we had, in January, we had an entertaining presentation from Ocean Phoenix, uh, followed by Viewport 3 and Savant. In February, we had three presentations again from SBG Systems, Salmara Subsea, and then Zupt. And then in March, that was followed by uh, Pangeo Subsea, Ocean Floor Geophysics, and Fugro. Um, moving into uh, Q2, this would have been our most kind of active um, quarter, really, of, of interaction with, uh, with, with people outside the society. Hydrofest would normally have been held in April at the university, but for a second year running, we had to deliver the presentations online. Um, which, which was okay. It, it, um, it was well received by the universities and they had the opportunity to submit questions um, to a panel of, uh, of committee members afterwards. Fingers crossed, we managed to get a real Hydrofest uh, this year at the uni. 
In May, we would have run our school's lecture day, rather a noisy event, but unfortunately for a second year, we had to cancel the face-to-face -face interaction. But we did provide the schools, the, the secondary schools with an activity pack, um, short PowerPoint with fun videos in there, telling them all about hydrographic survey, what a surveyor did, how, how they could become one. And then we had a quiz at the end that they could take part in. And um, we handed out some, some checks to local schools to contribute to their STEM departments. So it was all very worthwhile. So going into Q3, we continued our um, collaboration with, uh, with NOSP with two more events. In May, we had uh, BP, Ocean Infinity, Sonodyne and Ocean Floor Geophysics. That was a busy old night. And then in June, we had the National Decommissioning Centre, Fugro and Shell UK. So then we took a break over the summer and went back into um, September with, thankfully, a face-to-face -face event, which was uh, a great day, the golf event, 10 teams, unique systems winning, um, with some with some great high scores, nearest the pin and long drive um, prizes and sponsorship. Um, these events are made possible by sponsors. Um, we had Ashhead, Norbit, STR and Unique all sponsoring components of that day. And it was great. And thanks to Alan McDonald for organising yet again. Shame he couldn't actually take part in the day. Um, our student award programme has been running for the last five years. Um, last year, unfortunately, because of delays in the students actually starting their, uh, their, their, um, their teaching, we, we just didn't get any, we didn't get any submissions for the student award. It was a real shame, but we have been working with the universities over the last year. We have changed our submission time to the end of their term, which will be June this, uh, this year. And we have relaunched the award program to students in Aberdeen and Glasgow. And uh, fingers crossed, we'll have some submissions again this year. Um, we had planned um, our annual joint venture with SUT and IMCA for November back in uh, November 21. But um, unfortunately, I think everybody was just Zoomed or teamed out and uh, due to um, the lack of uh, registration, we actually had to cancel that event. However, we will be focusing on the face-to-face uh, -face event in November this year with the three organizations again putting that event together. Um, another um, initiative that we have launched over the last two or three months is the Emerging Talent Award. Um, and we're looking for the best and brightest individuals who've joined the hydrographic and energy industry um, in the last uh, three years. We've got some nice prizes and runner-up prizes, and we're looking for submissions um, very soon, by the end of this month, in fact. So we look forward to seeing submissions for that. We really do intend to return to some face-to-face -face events. We'd hoped that tonight would be face-to-face, -face, but alas, timings just weren't quite right. Um, but we are looking to hold our annual members' dinner on March the 10th at the Chester Hotel in Aberdeen, and more information on that will follow this week. We have a programme of events planned for what remains of Q1 and Q2, and those will be pub published through our usual channels. Um, Simon would like to thank the, um, the Hydrographic Society uh, committee for their hard work. We'd like to thank our individual members for support, um, corporate members, and of course our sponsors. Um, I'd like to thank Simon for guiding us through the last uh, 12 months, and also uh, Kevin, Kate, Matt, and Laura for making sure we get our to-do list actually ticked off. Right, so now we are on to our treasurer's report. Again, this was sent out um, in full by uh, Kevin as part of the information pack. Um, this is a summary that's on the screen, but I'm going to hand over to Kevin now, hopefully through the powers of StreamYard. I'm going to hand over to Kevin and he will talk us through the reports in more detail. 
Thank you, Nikki. Um, okay, as Nikki has, uh, has alluded to, there's been very um, limited events on this year. So um, this will be a quick summary of where we are. So there is no um, monthly meetings face to face, no annual dinner, Hydrofest or quiz or even the SUT. So the only event that did take place was the golf. Um, and that drew an income through tickets of 1,380 with sponsorship of 850 pounds. And then a limited income from our interest on our accounts, which we total at 2,237.19. So when we look at our expenditure again, similar to the income, very limited on the expenditure due to the event. So um, we did, as Nikki pointed out, gave some student uh, awards out. So that amounted to 500 pounds and then there were some of the golf costs as well, which was 975. And just due to some of the transactions that were taking place um, through our event price, we have £80.38. p. So expenditure was uh, 1555 this year, um, showing um, on there. So the account balances from the main account of 24364 Um Our education account of 9987 with our PayPal account. Um, at the end of the year of 1,039.69. So totaling 35,392.3 pence. Um, what I've done this year, though, is just highlighted on some of the uh, income we're due um, from some of the events. Some of those have been paid through. We have the events of 2,097 outstanding and also some of those um, events of 12 months and older. We still have outstanding and are being chased of 3,438. Um, so that's the, the minutes. So um, if there's any questions on those, if we can have them now in the comments or if we can have them proposed and seconded, please. Thank you, Damien, that's proposed. And if we could have a seconder, please. That's great. Okay, so moving on now back to Nikki. Hopefully you can all hear me again. Um, so we move on now to section four of the AGM, which is election of the committee members, which is um, including the office bearers. Now, as you can see from the slide here, Simon has offered to continue um, as our chair um, for another year. I've offered to continue as the deputy chair. Um, Kevin has offered to continue looking after the money as our treasurer. The role of deputy treasurer um, is vacant. And so we went out looking for um, volunteers for that role. Um, Kate has offered to continue as secretary. She actually just assumed that role um, in the last few weeks, taking over from Laura, who's now on maternity leave. So the role of deputy secretary is also up for election. Um, pleased to report that Lynn has put herself forward to fill the role of deputy treasurer. Um, we do not at this point have any offers of a deputy secretary role. So Kate is awfully keen for somebody to be her, her backup. So if anybody would like to put themselves forward in the comments, that's fine. If not, we will leave the position um, up, for, um, up for election um, or leave it vacant for now, but we would like to try and fill that as soon as possible. Um, so let's move on looking at our committee. Look at that lovely bunch. We have uh, Lynn, Ashley, Andy, Matt. I'm not going to read out all the names. We have slides for that purpose. So these are the people at the top that offered to continue um, on the uh, committee this year, and we're very grateful. Uh, we did have eight people stand down in 2021 for various reasons. Um, so moving on to the next slide, we've had two people join the committee. Um, which is Andy Irvin and Carl Zudwig. So at this point, 
um, we would like to propose that the office bearers, the existing committee members, um, and Lynn, who has put herself forward as our deputy treasurer, we'd like to confirm them in those positions. Um, we are open to any other, if anybody else would like to stand for election to the committee, or if there's any objections um, from the floor, uh, we'd like to give you the opportunity now to put those um, in the comments on the YouTube channel, and we'll give uh, we'll give a little bit of time for that to happen. If there are any objections, or if everybody is jumping to their keyboards to um, to help Kate out in the deputy secretary role, we would be delighted. Um, but we'd also like to. Um, have a motion please to approve the office bearers and committee for 2022. So if we could have somebody please, um, a proposer and a seconder for that motion, please. Again, putting your name in the comments. And my little team in the background here will be messaging me when that has been achieved so that we can move on. Can somebody propose and somebody second the motion for the office bearers? Achieved, says Kate. Well done. Thank you, everybody. Right. Last item on the agenda is any other business. And this is obviously open to, to our membership. So if there's anything that anybody would like to bring up, again, if you could please put that in the comments. Um, I did... I did mention earlier in the chairman's report that we will be running our annual members dinner on Thursday, the 10th of March, fingers crossed. So the flyer with that information will be coming out tomorrow and we will be looking to take bookings from that point and looking to secure some, some sponsorship from that point. But um, we're very excited. We need, to, uh, we need to have some face-to-face -face time. Right, I'm hoping that the silence has um, means that there is nothing else that's been raised from the floor. And I see that Mr. Carl Zudwig has proposed himself for Deputy Secretary. Is that correct or is that just a joke, Damien? but we can take that up at the next committee meeting. It's correct, fantastic. So nothing else has been raised. Um, let us therefore move on to the next item of the evening. We'll turn our attention to our two technical presentations. So, this topic has actually been on our to-do list for quite a while now. So we are absolutely delighted that we've managed to, uh, to grab both of our speakers tonight on the same evening. And we're going to explore the history of height and its measurement in the UK. So first of all, I'd like to introduce um, our first speaker, who is Mr. Mark Graves. He's been the senior production consultant for Geodesy at Ordnance Survey for the past eight years. He was a cartographic surveyor for eight years before moving into Geodesy team. He holds an MSc with distinction in engineering, surveying and Geodesy from Nottingham University's Institute of Engineering, Surveying and Space Geodesy and is also a member of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. So Mark specializes in geodetic GNSS computations and analysis, coordinate reference system realization and datum transformations. He's been responsible for several national GNSS network adjustments, including two internationally ratified realizations of the ETRS 89 coordinate reference system in the UK. Mark is a member of the team responsible for managing and developing 
the OSNet GNSS network since its inception. So Mark's presentation is titled A History of Height in Great Britain. And now using the powers of StreamYard, Damien, I hope I will be handing over to Mark. Hello. I think I'm live. I'm going to assume that I'm live. Good evening. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, it does seem to me rather strange that I'm going to do a presentation that involves talking about, uh, in some aspects, mean sea level to a, a virtual room full of hydrographers um, and hydrographic surveyors. And I'm sure there are plenty of people listening and watching tonight who have forgotten more about mean sea level than I will ever know. But uh, this is, of course, a, a, a little bit of a, a background and history on, on how we've um, measured and realised height on land in uh, Great Britain, United Kingdom. And I know the talk coming after me from the guys at the hydrographic office is obviously going to deal with height offshore. So uh, without further ado, let's see if the technology works. There we go. Um, I think one of the initial ideas or, or inspirations for this talk was the fact that the main height datum for mainland Great Britain, which is at Newlyn in Cornwall, uh, known as Ordnance State in Newlyn, was 100 years old last year. Uh, in April 2021, it marked 100 years since the, uh, the completion of the measurements that led to mean sea level and led to that little... Uh, brass bolt, which is, you just see it in this tiny picture here, which is inside this anonymous little hut on the end of Newland Pier, right down at the tip of the country. That is, that's bolt zero. That's where every single height on every OS map and any height that's been measured for the last century almost, they all relate back to this bolt here. Um, but first of all, I, I, I need to kind of Rather than dive straight into the history, I'm going to just do a little bit of background about the technical reasons for choosing mean sea level. Why, why choose that and not anything else? And a, a, a couple of other little kind of um, background history as to as to why we ended up with this magical bolt in this tiny little hut at the end of a pier at, at, at Newlyn Harbour. Um, so, so first of all, you, you, one of the obvious questions is. Why pick mean sea level? If, if, if you start from the assumption that for height, everybody has to at least agree where zero is, where does height start? Then why does it have to be mean sea level? Uh, why not high tide, low tide, or, or any point in between? Or as the second line says there, rather a glib comment, why not just pick, say, second step of St. Paul's Cathedral, and bang a nail in there and call it good, say, right, that's 100 metres and off we go. So as long as everyone agrees, what does it matter? Why, why, do we have, why do we tend to choose mean sea level? And it's generally because most of us, hydrographers perhaps excluded, are land-based creatures. We, 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 we tend to almost naturally think of this zero surface in between where we live. We say hills have height, oceans have depth. And, and, and that just seems like a natural thing to say. And, and as it says there on the slide, we, it implies this zero surface living somewhere in between those two extremes. And also, you know, if you stood on the shore, generally you walk away from the shoreline. The only way to go is up. So it, it kind of feels natural that, that that's where height starts. So that's kind of the, 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 the natural kind of human reason to, to choose somewhere that's, that's close to where your feet get wet, that's close to sea level. Um, of course, there's a, there's a scientific reason as well. Um, and I, I'm just going to try cover some of that. I'm not going to hopefully dive into a technical rabbit hole about why we choose mean sea level and all the science behind it. But it, it, what I call the journey from Earth to map, it in, includes this model and it includes a very good reason why mean sea level is almost the perfect point to choose as our data because that journey has to take us from the regular, uh, irregular, lumpy, uncooperative, unstable surface of the earth to, to a nice regular modeled environment for a, a map or a position. And the, the first kind of step on that journey, the first model that we need to adopt is a, is a surface that, that's 
called a geoid. Um, it's a little bit of a, a hypothetical concept. It's not something physical. You can't you can't touch it. You can't stick your finger on it. Um, it's and it's directly related to the varying gravity on 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 Earth. So obviously, Earth's gravity field is not constant. It varies wherever you go. And the, the diagram here is. Uh, the colours represent different intensities of gravity, and it's it's greatly exaggerated. But gravity is not constant; it does vary. Uh, that's mainly due to the physical makeup of the Earth and its internal mechanisms and things like that. But this the surface de devised by a constant level of gravity is called the geoid. And what might seem contradictory is that it's irregular as indicated by the diagram there it changes wherever you go but it's also level and that that sounds like it, it shouldn't match up because when you think of something that's level you naturally think of a flat surface a table or a tennis court or something like that and you say well how can it be regular and level but in this sense level means that it there's no work is done under gravity as you're moving across it so for any, any of you that have done any surveying, any leveling in particular, the first thing you do when you set your instrument up is adjust three feet on the on the instrument or on the tri-back, on the field light. There's usually a little uh, little pond bubble that you have to try get in the middle there. And, and, and you're then you're, you're aligning that instrument with the local direction of gravity. So it's, par its observations are parallel to and take place on the geoid. So it's the natural physical surface where all our observations and all our modeling takes place. So this is why it also becomes the natural and, and the very sensible surface to, to say, well, that's a zero height as well. Let's, let's take that as zero. And the reason this matches up with mean sea level is that if we, I said earlier that we, 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 might, we say hills have height and oceans have depth. So that's the effectively the topography of the earth. And the geoid is, is that surface in between that describes the basic physical shape of the Earth. You strip off the topography and you're kind of left with the geoid. And, and a quite happy coincidence or, or, or science is that, in theory, if the oceans of the Earth were only under the influence of Earth gravity, so, so no tides, no influence of the moon or the sun or the planets or all those other gravitational uh, attractions that give us tides and currents. If the oceans were just sat there only under the influence of Earth gravity, then the shape that would be adopted is very close to the shape of the geoid. So if you can measure the average of that shape, mean sea level, uh, which evens out all the tides and all the currents, then that effectively on land gives you a point to th th that's also on the geoid. So you can then use that as your as the starting point for your height. So that's that's why this, this point here where mean sea level hits the land, that's where we'll have our tide gauge. And eventually if we, we measure mean sea level there, then we know that that point is on the geoid and we can, from there, we can go off across the country, spreading height around and they'll all be related back to this, this point here. Um, just a little bit, I'm, I'm sure this is obvious to, to many of you, but Measuring sea level is 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 kind of as, as fairly straightforward as it sounds. You you basically have something floating up and down on the tide, and you just need to measure the changing of the height of of the float or the device or whatever it is. Uh, and a standard setup for a tide gauge is as, as shown by this diagram here. You've got the float going up and down, and there's some kind of recorder at the top, which is what uh, I think this is a picture of one of the instruments that used to live in the hut at Newlyn. And you know the relationship between this this instrument here and your chosen reference point at the tide gauge. And over a long period of time, this float's going up and down and up and down. You mean out all those measurements, and that, as the name suggests, gives you mean sea level. Uh, and you then apply that difference to your reference point, uh, which for Newland, I think, is 4.7 something meters. And, and off you go, you've got your zero height. and you can use that for, for the rest of the country. So a little bit of the history, the height in, in Great Britain, the height in UK, uh, has not always been at Newland. It started um, in 1840 in Liverpool. And a few slides ago, I mentioned that 
it was almost a, uh, uh, almost a throwaway comment that, that, that said, why can't we have the second step of St. Paul's Cathedral as our point of zero height and just this arbitrary point? Well, in actual fact, that's, that's what was done, first of all. In 1840, someone put a mark, or there was already a mark on St. John's Church in Liverpool, uh, and they said, right, that's 100 foot above Dayton. Off we go. And that was it. There was this arbitrary point. Uh, unfortunately, St. John's Church is not there anymore. It's now been I think it was demolished quite some time ago. It's now St. John's Gardens in the centre of Liverpool. Um, but this, this period was also the period where uh, surveyors, scientists were just starting to understand the, the, the science and some of the relationships about why mean sea level does make a good datum. Uh, so George Airy, who went on to become astronomer royal, um, was doing did studies around tide gauges of Ireland and, and quickly came to the conclusion that mean sea level between them was fairly unchanging and was therefore a, a very good and stable uh, surface to use as the zero height. So, so just four, day, four days, four years later, and uh, they took just 10 days of tidal observations at uh, Victoria Dock, again in Liverpool, uh, and declared that to be 43 feet higher than the original datum on St John's Church. And that became the datum for the entire country. Uh, and unfortunately, Victoria Dock is no longer there. It was filled in quite some time ago, but that's roughly uh, where, it, where it is today, uh, just south of Trafalgar Dock, apparently. Um, and it was it's this stayed the datum uh, for for Great Britain until Newland took over in the uh, early 19, 1920s. <laughs> Excuse me. So by by the start of the the, the 20th century, by the early 1900s, it became clear that benchmarks and the heights and and any other observations. And markers linked to Liverpool were they'd fallen into disrepair. It was becoming clear um, as as kind of science advanced and the understanding about sea level and leveling and heights was advancing. It, it was clear that there were the Liverpool heights and the Liverpool datum was was unfortunately no longer fit for purpose. So uh, the Ordnance Survey established three brand new tide gauges at uh, one at Newland, obviously. One at Felixstowe on the uh, east coast and one all the way up at Thumbar. And the idea was that the three sites, the three tide gauges would all measure and determine mean sea level. And they would all act <coughs> as, a, as a combined reference with each other. Um, but when the first measurements and the, the, the first comparisons were done, it, it, Dunbar was, was different. It, unexpectedly, there was a 25 centimetre difference between mean sea level as measured at Felixstowe and at Newlyn as there was at Dunbar. And at the time, this is over 100 years ago, they, they couldn't, to be honest, they couldn't explain this. Um, the science and the understanding of how mean sea level can vary and, and, and the real fine mechanics behind it, and also the science of understanding the potential errors in the leveling, because it's quite some distance clearly between here and here. So you're your leveling is not going to be perfect, it means that it's the understanding at the moment is it's now the difference is, is explained by a combination of the two. There very likely is a real difference in mean sea level between down here in the south uh, and, and all the way up towards Edinburgh. Um, but the bulk of the difference is, is quite likely due to errors in the historical leveling measurements. So it does strictly mean that uh, on a scientific level, at least, the, the, the datum, the height datum has got a slight tilt in it uh, and, and it drifts a little bit away from mean sea level as you get further north. Um, but that's really, uh, it, it's kind of been argued back and forth between various academics for quite, for decades, really. So it's, it's, it's really only a concern at the scientific level. And, and, and generally, the heights across the country are still you know, fit for purpose, and, and they still realize Ordnance Data Newland to a, a satisfactory level. Um, but what they ended up doing at the time was just choosing Newling as, as a single reference. So they, they effectively chose to ignore Dunbar and Felix, though, and they just went with, with the reference at Newling. Um, and and New, Newling's a good choice. 
It's uh, obviously most of Devon and Cornwall is is good solid granite bedrock, so it's a it's a good solid surface to sit on. Um, it's very near uh, the, the the actual Atlantic, the continental shelf. So the tide that it experiences a, is a full ocean tide. It's not uh, distorted or it doesn't get any noise from estuaries or or the near coast or anything like that. Um, so from 1915 to 1921, uh, every day or several times a day, that little float goes up and down and makes its mark on the on the piece of paper and the rotating drum on the the measuring equipment in the little hut. Uh, and I think at least once a day, or perhaps several times a day, somebody, some surveyor, had to trog on down to the end of the uh, end of the pier and write all this down and, and enter it in a logbook and and. You know, make all the calculations, and after after six years, uh, we had a, a, a height for mean sea level. Now, as it says here, the actual period of, of uh, every single tidal component, because the tide is 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 made up of of about thirty five, thirty six measurable components. Uh, for example, the, the influence of the moon is obviously perhaps component number one, that's one of the biggest effects. And then there's the sun and there's the sun and the moon together and the planets and there's all kind and they get smaller and smaller and finer and finer. But overall there's there's at least 30 some different components. And very strictly speaking, to capture the cycles of all those different components, you should really measure sea level for 18.6 years. And that's when the whole thing starts to repeat again. But six is is still an extremely good answer. You, after six years, you're going to get all the major components of the tide and get a very good, accurate answer for mean sea level. So, so the compromise at Newlyn and the other tide gauges was they, they stuck at six. Uh, and that's officially called Ordnance Datum Newlyn, Newlyn for obvious reasons, and Ordnance because it was Ordnance Survey that, that did the, back in, in those days, did the measurements. And uh, oh, yeah, here we are. The, the, the bolt zero inside the hut is. 4.751 meters above that mean sea level measurement. So you could stick your level in stave on that bolt and head on down the pier and out into New and leapfrogging the height across the country as you go. And your starting height would be 4.751. But of course, having height just at New Lynn, just at a single point, is, is not really much use to anyone. So clearly we need to spread that height across the country where a, a, a geodetic term is is to realize the datum so you have a datum and you've defined it at a point but you need that datum to be accessible to your users uh but someone you know a user needs to go to a known point to to capture that height and to realize that datum and then take it off onto site or wherever they need to go so this led to well over half a million benchmarks ultimately across gb all tied back to that single Bolt in Newland. And I'm sure many of you have seen these, these, these cut marks on, on walls and buildings. Uh, anywhere along a main road, which would have been a leveling line, you, you're bound to get one of these every few hundred meters. Um, and the, the, the bench, the name benchmark, apparently, or so I understand, comes from the, the arrow mark uh, was and perhaps still is a, a, an indicator of, of government. Go quite a lot of government and naval property would have an arrow on it. So the bench, this horizontal line was added. That's the actual marker of the height. So then you get the term benchmark. Uh, and we, we also have 200 of these, which are fundamental benchmarks, um, which were kind of the zero order markers. So a, a leveling line would run for a certain distance and, and it ultimately link up with one of these. These were kind of the, the junction points for all the leveling lines. Uh, and as you can see, this, I forget where this one is, but this was one that we had to open up a few years ago to repair the little uh, pillar that goes with it. And the, the, you can just see the bolt there, that has a height, but the master reference bolts are buried in this concrete chamber covered by this hefty slab here. There's, a, there's another bolt, and I think in there is a piece of flint. And this whole thing will be resting on bedrock. So these are about as stable as it's possible to get. Uh, in terms of height reference. And although the, the, the half a million benchmarks, the Ordnance Survey don't use them anymore, we haven't leveled them for decades or maintained them for a long time. The fundamental marks are still very important. They're still the physical marks that help us 
realise Ordnance State of Newland today. We do it differently now, and I'm going to come on to that. But these these marks are still kind of live, living marks, and we try obviously protect them at all costs because they're the physical embodiment of, of Ordnance State of Newland. Um, and I, I just need to point out that ODN really only relates to mainland Great Britain as well. Uh, the larger islands uh, around the coast are the Orkneys, the Outer Hebrides, the Shetlands, Isle of Man, the Scilly Isles, for example. They all have their own similar mean sea level based datums because uh, it's increasing, it's very difficult, if not near impossible, to level over long distances of water. So whenever you get to a significant uh, boundary of some water, you, 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 your datum has to stop when it comes to traditional leveling so that's why the outline islands have their own specific datums um in the satellite age though because obviously everyone's now using gps or gnss because there's gps isn't the only system anymore we we need to do something slightly different the main reason for that is that the the, the height reference surface when you're you've got your position from your gps receiver the height reference surface is not related to mean sea level. It's not the geoid. Um, it's a simple shape called the, the, ref, the reference surface is the, is the ellipsoid. And earlier on, I mentioned that this, this journey from Earth to map and the, the first stop on that journey is the geoid. And the second stop on that journey is the ellipsoid. Uh, the, the aim is to have an ellipsoid that fits the geoid in, a, in, a, in an average way as, as closely as possible. So uh, clearly, though, it's a different surface and there's physically a difference between the two. And in, in Great Britain, in the UK, that's very approximately about 50 metres. So I'm trying to remember which way around it is. I think the, the ellipsoid is, fifth, is very roughly 50 metres below mean sea level or below the geoid in this country. Um, and... And another reason for, for not really wanting to use the ellipsoid is that the heights are, are, are what you call, they're not really natural. And by that, I mean, it's, it, it's perfectly possible to have two, two points with ellipsoidal heights and one point based on the ellipsoidal height might appear to be above the other. So you would, uh, you would expect, you know, being a natural process, a physical process, you would expect water in a pipe for example to, to run from the highest point to the lowest point but with ellipsoidal heights you might the, the, there's a, there's a chance you could you could actually get the opposite um, because of the deviation between the natural geoid and mean sea level surface and the, the regular surface of the ellipsoid it, it could be the other way around so so we still need to to relate back to this physical gravity-based natural surface which is geoid and mean sea level um, and that includes our surveyors all our surveyors 250 surveyors are all using high precision uh, gps gnss receivers are able to, to to achieve positions literally down to a centimeter or so um, but all their all their heights and positions are, are converted back to this this natural geoid mean sea level surface and the way we do that, there's, there's various ways of doing that. And it, it obviously depends on what kind of accuracy you're trying to achieve. But in this country, we have what's called a geoid model. Uh, and, and our particular model is, is it's kind of a, sometimes you might hear it described as a rubber sheet. It's a, it's a grid of varying parameters. Uh, and the same model also models the difference in, in plan between the GPS uh, model and our mapping Eastings and Northings. So it's all combined into one. But the high component is, is known as OSGM15, and the GM stands for, for geoid model. Uh, and essentially, every, every kilometre, we, we have a value of the difference between mean sea level ODN and the ellipsoid. So any, uh, any ellipsoid heights that come off our surveyors, surveying kits, pass through this model and get converted to, to correct ODN heights, natural heights, above, above mean sea level, above ODN. Um, and I said earlier about the different islands. So the Outer Hebrides have got their own datum and Shetland and Orkney have as well and Isle of Man and Isles of Scilly. 
those their mean sea level data models are also incorporated in OSGM 15. So even though ODN is really only middle and Great Britain, OSGM 15 covers the whole lot in, in a single model. It's all been mapped in the same model. Uh, and if you wanted to be really pedantic, you could say that OSGM 15 is, is not a true geoid model because it's not based purely on gravity. It's, it started as a pure gravity-based surface, but then it was fitted to the heights of those 200 fundamental benchmarks that I, I, I showed in the earlier slide. And that's why those benchmarks are still so fundamentally important for heights in Great Britain, because there are physical relationship back to Ordnance State of Newland. Uh, and for the datums in the outer islands, we chose similar points. So we, we took a gravity model and kind of bent it a little bit to fit our existing realization of mean sea level. So very strictly speaking, uh, OSGM 15 should be called a height corrector surface and not a geoid model, but we, we retained the name just because just it was easier for users. That's what we've been calling it for quite some time. So what might happen in the future? Um, well, first of all, the, one of the questions I get quite a lot is, well, well mean sea level's rising. That's, that's a, a fairly well-known fact. Sea levels are rising on average. And very roughly, sea level at Newland is now about 20 centimetres higher than it was when Ordnance Day Newland was, was first measured 100 years ago. Um, but that's not really significant enough to, to warrant a wholesale change of the datum just yet. Um, but I think it's clear that we have to move with the times and picking one point and one mean sea level for the entire country and, and, and hanging our entire hat on that. It's, it's not really the way you would do things now, especially in the satellite age, especially that most positioning is now satellite based. So, so the next version of ODN is, is very, very likely to be just a model, a pure gravity based geoid model. No fitting to FBMs, no distortion to FBMs or anything like that. Um, and you, you can choose a specific uh, value for the, the, the strength of gravity so that your surface would align with mean sea level it is, as it is now. So the, 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 any future surface will really only be a few tens of centimetres different from Newland. It won't be a, a massive several metres wholesale change. Um, but of course, if, if, if mean sea level does go up or if the datum that we assign to mean sea level has got, that means that uh, if, if, if you like walking in Scotland, if you like bagging Munro's, some of them might go down. Some of them might not be Munro's anymore. If there are any that are close to that magical 3,000 foot threshold, if, we, if the underlying datum goes up a little bit, then the height of the mountain will go down by a the same amount, so we might lose a Munro or two. Um, and poor old Calf Top, which is a, a, a hill in the Yorkshire Dales. In, in, in 2010, it was measured by GPS. Some amateurs took a GPS unit up there and accurately measured its height. And it, it failed the magic 2,000 foot marker of becoming a mountain by just two centimeters. Um, but then when we improved the model to GM15 a few years ago, the upshot was that the, the height change meant that it crept into becoming a mountain by six millimeters. So calf top became a mountain just by six millimeters. But of course, if we change the sea level datum and, and align it to sea level it is now, then, then poor old calf top is going to be relegated to a hill again. So those are some of the upshots. And I think that's a, that's a reasonable story to end on, I think. So uh, thank you very much. I hope you found that interesting. Thanks, Mark. That really, uh, that really was um, very interesting. As a um, as a geologist as well, got to throw that in. We've got a good question here from Walter. I think you've already answered it, though. I think so. Okay. Walter was asking about. No. It is in the comments. So right. Okay. Let me try to see that as well somewhere. I can I can read it out for you as well. We've Walter's asking. How do we? It's the, the the sinking of Southeast England, with with the yeah, isostatic. Um, so is that answered uh, with your gravity based uh, model? Yes, kind of. Um, this is where you get the conflict between uh, high end science and 
the practicalities of users. We're, we're quite lucky in this country that we don't really have really any significant isostatic adjustment. We're, we're unlike our kind of our Scandinavian colleagues who, who they have to take in uh, the, the rebound as part of their height model. Quite a, most of the Scandinavian countries these days have a, have a, a height model that's, that is based on a gravity surface, but it includes a time dependent uh, displacement or a time dependent distortion. To, to try account for the fact that they're all still bouncing back after the retreat of the glaciers. Now, fortunately, in this country, we don't really have that at any significant level. They, yeah, on a, on a fine scientific measurement level, there probably is a little bit, um, but for practical heighting, it's not, it's not really something of concern. So th the, the short answer to that question is there's no real need to worry about that. Uh, and at the end of the day, you still need to pick a fixed point and kind of go with it for a while. So even if the new model might last another hundred years until sea levels rising and, and a little bit of residual isostatic rebound comes into play to, to mean that we have to revalue it, then then so be it. But I think to get a hundred years out of a model and a datum is uh, without having to, to, to be forced to change it is, is, is fairly good. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I thought the question was going to be about ocean tide loading. Because Newland in Cornwall is is kind of infamous for bouncing up and down with the tide ten centimeters every day. As the tide comes in, the whole of Newland, uh, Cornwall, and Devon gets pressed down, and then as the tide goes out, it springs back up again. Uh, but that's an effect that has only been come apparent and measurable with the advent of satellite positioning. So obviously, okay. when they picked Newland, they have ocean tide loading wasn't even a thing. So, but so it, that's another common question I quite often get asked about. How does ocean tide loading affect picking Newland for the the date, datum site? Okay, well, thanks for the. So, who just a from a practical point of view, because I'm a kind of practical person, who maintains your who maintains your fundamental benchmarks? Is that is that your job? Do you guys? Yeah, we do. And... Yeah, we, I mean, obviously, all the benchmarks are redundant, and 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 in the horizontal world, the the, the trig pillars, we don't use those anymore. Um, but yeah, the, the, the 200 and odd FBMs are, are really the only physical marks that we we go out of our way to maintain these days because they do okay. they do still, as I say, represent that physical surface. The, the, the heights of those markers are, are, are the physical realization of ODN. Okay. Um, we've actually got one more question here as well from Damien. Um, hopefully not getting too distracted from his streamyarding job. Um, <laughs> he's asking, is there a timeline for an updated MSL for OS based on a gravitational model? Not as such. Um, we are I probably this year or maybe early next year, we are seriously planning uh, the first step on that journey, which is a, a public consultation, because any any consideration to changing ODM and moving towards a gravity based model is tied up with similar changes in the horizontal world. So the, the horizontal companion to Ordnance State of Newland is OSGB 36 National Grid, which is 80 odd years old. It was designed in 1936, as the name suggests. Um, and there are similar reasons for wanting to update that system. But clearly, we can't go ahead and just propose a new system without trying to gain uh, feedback from users. What do users want? What, what are the impacts? What will be the advantages? What are the disadvantages? So the first step is a, is a public consultation on those issues. And, and the intention is to start that ball rolling this year. But other than that, there's there's not yet there's no hard timeline that says we will disband ODN at this point and we'll adopt a model at that point it's still very early stages as I say of, of kind of thinking about it and, and consulting on it okay super well look thank you thank you very much I hope you'll come okay, back on at the you. end in case there's any yeah, further yeah, questions I'll, 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 I'm yeah. certainly going to hang around and listen to the guys from the Hydro office cool thank you very much indeed thanks Thank you. Um, okay, 
we are going to move on to our second speaker for tonight, um, who is um, Paul Marks. He is a product manager and GIS specialist working in the maritime industry for over 17 years at the UK Hydrographic Office. Paul is recognised by Imarist as a registered marine scientist and has won, this is very impressive, and has won the MOD Defence Surveyors Award. Uh, so in his role as the product manager for the Admiralty Marine Data uh, Portal and Seabed Mapping Services, he's led the development of new products and services for accessing the UKHO's marine data. Paul combines his love of user experience design with geospatial data, transforming the way people access marine location-based information with the introduction of new products and new services. So Paul's presentation this evening is titled A Brief Look at the History and the Future of VORF Vertical Offshore Reference Frame. So without further delay, again with the powers of Damien, here we go. I shall hand over to Paul. Welcome, Paul. Thank you for taking part this evening. Thank you, Nikki, and um, thank over you, everyone. To you. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Nikki, for for that introduction, and and thank you, Mark, as well for the, the interesting presentation beforehand, um, and thank you to you all for ha uh, having me this evening. So, as Nikki says, a uh, product manager at, at the UK Hydrographic Office, and I'm going to talk about uh, VORF, uh, vertical for reference frame. Many of you may be uh, aware of what VORF is. You may have used it. You may not be, um, and I'm just going to talk us through, you know. A brief presentation outline here. We're going to talk about just briefly what what is VORF, um, how it was created, uh, how it was tested, how VORF is used, uh, and the benefits that it, it provides uh, for uh, hydrographic surveying and and beyond. And then I'll just touch on on what the future uh, for VORF is. So diving in, what is VORF? As I say, it's vertical offshore reference frame. Um, VORF is, is a set of high resolution um, digital models of reference surfaces um, that can be then modeled against ETRF 89 um, and essentially it allows geospatial data to be um, re-referenced uh, against a number of datums, uh, particularly marine vertical datums, uh, as you would expect from the hydrographic office. Um, so it's a way of us relating between these marine vertical datums, as I say, um, and with ETRF 89 um, as the ellipsoid um, chart datum being very important, other tidal datums, HAT, LAT, and we've got some slides in a moment, um, over, I think it, it's 15 land datums as well. So OS uh, datum Newland, uh, as mentioned by Mark, um, but also those various other uh, land datums as well um, that we've got. So, you know, uh, Belfast and, and Isle of Man and, and, and other places as well. Um, there's a lot there. And as I say, look, it says there, it covers the UK and Irish waters. So as I say, it covers the entire UK and Irish uh, continental shelves, as well as the Channel Islands. So just to, to throw that in there as well. So it covers the Channel Islands and it can convert um, between chart datum, uh, any of the tidal datums at any point in this area. The sea datums, if we want to call them that, call them those, they extend approximately one nautical mile in land. Um, and then the models for the land datums extend approximately three nautical miles offshore. So in that zone where we've got that overlap, we're then also able to uh, convert and provide um, the, the measurement to convert between those datums in uh, that overlap. So again, just looking um, at uh, you know, what, what datum does VORF cover, as it, as it says here in the diagram, um, I've mentioned chart datum, which is very important, obviously, for, for us in the hydrographic uh, office and, and the production of, of the nautical charts, um, but also the five tidal datums, the, the marine datums there that are key for us as well, the highest astronomical tide, marine, uh, mean high water springs, mean sea level, which we've just heard a lot, a lot about from Mark, mean low water springs, um, and uh, lowest astronomical tide as well. 
and then I've mentioned it was 14 land items apologies I think I said 15 um, I was getting ahead of myself um, and also uh, two GNSS related datums as well so that ETRF and also ITRF 2000 as well so the model models I should say within VORF um, and so VORF is not necessarily one thing it's a set of models and um, there's a GUI there's output there's all sorts there but VORF allows this um, ability for us to easily um, manipulate well, I was going to say manipulate but but allows us to re-reference geospatial data between those re reference frames so what resolution uh, is the VORF um, data, the model? So the model um, and the nodes within the model, um, they were modeled at 0 0.008 degree intervals. Sorry, get that right. Which is about 900 meters in latitude, depending on, on what latitude you are, um, and about 500 meters in, in longitude um, due to projection. projection. Um, and the model can then or, or is used then to interpolate, calculate a value at any of the locations between nodes. Um, and what we found then is we've increased the resolution, um, which just unfortunately dropped off the, the slide there, but where the tidal regime is more complex, um, so along rivers, um, uh, estuaries, etc., there's a higher resolution grid as well within that model. Um, and that's approximately 225 meters in latitude, 120 um, in longitude. So uh, a more uh, high resolution where the node points. And these nodes are where essentially the calculation was taking place. Um, and this is, you know, one thing that I haven't mentioned is, you know, VORF, and I will mention further, you know, University College London uh, working closely in, in developing this model um, with the UKHA um, and on our behalf. Um, and one of the, the interesting things was when calculating um, the data and the, the calculations for each one of those nodes, um, at the time it took all of UCL's distributed computing power, this is kind of pre-cloud, um, the entire weekend it took up that entire compute power for the entire weekend to calculate the initial model um, uh, for VORF or, or the models I should say for VORF. So we talked about the output, uh, oh, the, the output, we've talked about the model there um, and the VORF output and this really is, is I suppose the I was going to say the useful element. This is the bit that really can help um, externally and internally and users. So internally, the UKHA, uh, we have a VORF GUI, uh, which gives us access to the models, allows us to um, kind of run the calculations and, and pull the information out. And you can see uh, a screenshot in the middle there of that. Externally, um, for, for users, we allow via the VORF data service, which is at the bottom there, uh, users can download .vrf files, so um, essentially text files in effect, but VORF files, um, and these are 10 kilometer square blocks of VORF data points. So they're not the nodes specifically, but these are data points, and they're very close essentially to where the nodes, they're 800 meters uh, as part spaced. Um, and within each of the uh, delimited text files, as it says there, there's longitude, latitude. Um, I was going to say, bizarrely, there's something, a field called new depth, which is effectively the separation value. It's a quirk of kind of how the data is produced that it calls it new depth, unfortunately, but it's a separation value in meters. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see on your screens at all, but um, in the example on, on screen there, it's it's 56 point um, something meters for each one of those points there that you've got available. Also that we've got there is then the uncertainty value as well, which is really key. This is then a value is, you know, I think in the example, 0.125, um, but, and, and will vary for each one of those data points. Um, and when we went through the testing and the creation of VORF, we had very clear accuracies that we wanted VORF to perform to, for it to be fit for purpose for how we wanted to use VORF um, and how we would, would want others to be able to use VORF with, with a certain level of certainty. Yeah. Um, and the uncertainty values there, we'll talk about that through the testing in a moment, um, fall below 0 0.15 effectively. Um, but every data point is given that uncertainty to, again, help with the calculations that, that the end user will be able to make with it. 
I've put a couple of links in there where you can find out more information about uh, VORF. You can access the data as well if you wanted to. Um, so you can go to our data hub, uh, the marine data portal, where you then be able to access uh, the VORF data service and be able to access that data. So that was kind of a quick run through, hopefully, of, of kind of what VORF is. If if you haven't kind of come across it, what's it, it's Hopefully you can see how useful it can be. Um, but one of the interesting things was kind of how it was created um, and how VORF was created. Um, and as I mentioned, um, this was work that was done predominantly by uh, University College London, UCL, um, working with us. And, and VORF was created using a number of um, data sources, um, tide gauge data, um, GPS, as it was GNS uh, data, satellite altimetry data being key, uh, gravity field models like the geoid and you know Gladmark was on first because you'll actually see uh, an example here of it, of it being used as well, um, and tidal modeling as well coming into that. So a number of factors being brought together to then be calculated for each of those nodes um, to create those, those models. So the, one of the first things was using the permanent um, service for mean sea level gauges, um, which is so it's tying in nicely with with Mark's talk. Um, but you know, we've got high actually long time series of measurements, um, but a low density, you know, they're, they're spaced around uh, the country that you can see uh, in the map on screen. Um, it's, it's quite low density. So to be able to get the right uh, amount of data to be able to produce the model, we then needed to fill that in and we're using Admiralty table, tide table gauges as well. Um, they're lower actually, shorter time series, but a higher density and also uh, key, the only definition really of chart data. So it was key to be able to bring that in as well. Um, and you can see how as we're now building up the data, so we've built up tide gauge information around the coast. Um, but unfortunately, some of those tide gauges didn't actually have a connection to any of the standard vertical data. So we had tide gauges, but no uh connection to the vertical data at all and this is where we were able to then go out and um, carry out gps observations uh, at those locations and provide the connection very much uh, fortunately like uh, mark just described in the previous talk so one of the key then um pieces of data to enable um you know, VORF to have a vertical offshore uh, reference frame was satellite altimetry data. This provided high accuracy data into the model, um, but it data that, that does degrade as you get closer to the shore, uh, there's, the altimeter starts to sense the land and unfortunately that, that throws it. So that leaves, a, you know, approximately a 15 kilometer gap around uh, any land. But as I say, we've got the tide gauge, we've got the altimetry data, we're, we're beginning to piece and pull this, this puzzle together. Um, to build it. The next aspect of data that came in, um, as it says there, the, the gravity field models, um, VORF uses OSGM02, uh, and as Mark just mentioned, uh, OSGM15 uh, is actually there. VORF was, um, hasn't been recomputed uh, to incorporate the latest uh, OSGM15. Um, or oh, models at present that hasn't affected the accuracies and the uncertainties within VORF um, and, and kind of again referring back to Mark's talk but there isn't enough at the moment to need that recompute but clearly it's going to need to happen uh, as we progress and go forward in time um, so that is something uh, that does need to kind of come into the VORF model um, as, as we progress. But that was used, um, so that's to, to be aware of it as you're using data. So we produce these models, we've, we've got some great stuff um, uh, and we've got these surfaces, but one thing that was needed is, you know, kind of uh, how do we test this? How do we ensure that VORF is, is fit for purpose? And especially in a world of, as uh, you know, all of you are much more uh, qualified and aware, you know, isn't necessarily as, uh, I was gonna say as easy as land with water, you know, and, and there's a lot more kind of going on. You know, how are we gonna test that? How are we gonna be ensure that, that it's uh, fit for purpose and good for use? Well, fortunately, uh, I say fortunately, testing took a, over four years, really. Um, final delivery, and I, I'll touch on kind of the timeline in a moment. Um, final delivery it, it was in 2012 for VORF, and that's really when it operational use came in. Um, 
without validation. And so for four years um, through the civil hydrography program, um, and so, you know, credit for, for the civil hydrogra hydrography program, identifying how useful WOLF can be and asking uh, via the MCA survey contractors um, to validate for at the beginning of surveys um, to be able to provide those comparisons between observed um, and and the WOLF model that enabled um, us to create a network of validation that then led to the operational use of WOLF so being able to effectively test it in in anger, in, in, you know, use, you know, getting people to be able to use it and validate it meant that then we could be much more certain uh, and we can then bring it in. That wasn't the only testing. There was a lot more testing as well before it got to kind of that validation. As it mentions here, you know, uh, 245 checks are on datum connections uh, and mostly coastal points. Um, 63 comparisons between VORF, uh, corrected tidal levels and observed with GNS and tide gauge data six commercial uh, specially commissioned offshore tide gauges deployments and and as i've already mentioned in the, the uncertainty all of this testing led really to showing that VORF um, surfaces met their target accuracies uh, of 0.1 uh, meters inshore uh, and 0.15 meters uh, offshore so that's the formal uncertainties and, and VORF was uh, providing calculations that uh, fell under those uh, target accuracies. Um, so, and also, as it says there, you know, when we're validating, it, it actually showed that, that the errors were a fair reflection of what was actually encountered. Um, so, I've kind of gone on, said lots of different things, maybe from different angles, because Wolf was, um, uh, there's been a lot going on and, and quite complex, but here we've got just a timeline, hopefully, that will help uh, set the scene of where, where it came from. So as I say, 2005 was the time when the idea was conceived, should we say, the project starts. Um, uh, and that project starts with, with UCL, University College London, uh, asked to develop the VORF model. Um, and, you know, them working, yeah, really hard working, pulling all of that data that we've just talked about, how VORF was created, led to 2008 when the completed model uh, with a recompute where I spoke earlier about the nodes and the increased resolution around uh, rivers and estuaries. That was something that was needed uh, to ensure that that actually we noticed some, uh, I wouldn't say errors, but but variation that meant that, that we needed a, a denser um, uh, resolution for the model uh, in those areas. So that was recomputed and, and delivered in 2008. And that's when the testing and the validation begins. And as I say, four years of, of kind of validating through the civil hydrography, hydrography program, sorry, always get my words mixed up there, um, meant that uh, we were able to validate that. And it was in 2012 when our internal product safety board, and, and they're really keen to make sure, you know, everything is, is, is safe for use with, you know, safety of life at sea and charts and the publications and things um, and they approved the use of VORF and kind of rubber stamped it and that was a key moment because that kind of triggered uh, uh, a couple of activities um, that you know VORF Global uh, came about and VORF Global really was from the Royal Navy identifying that VORF had a had a use and was um, uh, you know, useful, it's now signed off as safe and things. And they asked, uh, again, uh, UCL and commissioned and, and it was delivered a, a VORF Global. Not quite the same as um, VORF for the UK, if we call it VORF UK for a moment, but, but you know, it's not the same, but it, it kind of does the same job. It's much more kind of uh, aimed at, as you can see there, the kind of oceans as opposed to coastal areas. Um, so, that's an RN thing uh, and sits there. Um, but also, you know, with that kind of approval and the sign off, uh, it led really to the academic paper as well, um, which uh, I would recommend actually, if anyone wanted to kind of look and really understand a lot more about VORF, how it was created, um, and that co authored paper between um, uh, the UK Hydrographic Office and UCL uh, was also released then in 2013. In 2019 is when we moved to having a self-serve uh, web app. 
um, or website to allow customers to select and download blocks of auth data which i mentioned earlier so this now gives that ability for people to able to uh, access uh, and download uh, and purchase auth blocks So just a, a bit now on kind of ORF and how it's used and, and obviously, you know, I've mentioned it's used within uh, the hydrographic office um, and one of the key um, benefits of VORF, um, one of the key things in the efficiency um, and the consistency of hydrographic surveys uh, is that VORF allows um, the acquisition data by the um, GNS so with respect to the ellipsoid um, uh, and then trans, uh, transforming it to the chart datum uh, and it eliminates the need for the tidal observations and so that that's a great thing um, as it says it's much more efficient potentially um, uh, you know it's much easier quicker to be able to do it it gives consistency as well so different um, you know maybe tidal observations at different times may come with different results rather than uh you know kind of effectively using vorf which would give you a consistent um between the ellipsoid and and then chart datum so you're getting that consistency and and you know pr predominantly this is how vorf uh has been used and for the last well decade 2012 um you know that that's predominantly how you know vorf has really been used when VORF was first thought up, though, as well, it, it also raised the possibility that VORF provides the link between terrestrial and marine data and, and may be able to help with that kind of um, data on different datums in, in the, the kind of terrestrial world, marine world, and, and at, atmospheric as well data that, that may come in. And it, it didn't quite get a lot of use, but actually, um, increasingly there's more use in this world and certainly um, more renewable energy more um, uh, development in that zone where uh, more and more data that especially you know kind of needing to bring atmospheric data and um, marine data together in that coastal zone uh, VORF is actually becoming really useful um, and, and this use case now is, is really beginning to develop a bit more the, the third use case and the third eye was really one for the future still uh, and still is for the future. So um, some of you may be aware um, and, and be aware of the IHO's um, S100 uh, framework uh, and the future navigation standards and data standards that, that are coming under that framework. Um, and, and if you're not, then by all means, you know, visit uh, our website um uh, admiralty.co.uk but also the IHO's website you can find out more information there about those those standards coming and, and future navigation but in this this world of future navigation um we can see there being a potential use case for real-time navigation uh you know with GNS on board um an onboard transformation from satellite data into chart data and and that potentially starts to give you potentially uh more accurate undercool clearance uh, and starts to, you know, kind of layer in, you know, increasingly, you know, the efficiencies for shipping, the the increase in data potentially. Um, so yeah, this isn't one that hasn't hasn't happened yet, but certainly we could see there being potential in the future uh, for this for shipping, for autonomous, um, for a number of, of of different use cases in in that environment. So. Uh, as promised, I've kind of hopefully given you a brief on, you know, how, uh, what Wolf is, how it's been created, tested, uh, how it's been used, um, and, and now what, what the future is for Wolf. As I mentioned it, you know, it's really useful, it's key, it, it's really showing uh, how important and how useful it can be in this um, uh, environment um, and, and in those use cases. But as I mentioned, um, you know, using OS uh, GM02 currently within the Wolf model, it uh, needs to be recomputed. Re uh, you know, it's not it's not inaccurate at the moment or anything like that. Um, but as you know, kind of uh, to Mark's point as well, you know, as, t as time goes on, on different ways of and um, of you know, kind of calculating building these models you know they need to be refreshed uh unfortunately it, it won't be around for 100 years uh like uh os 
uh, ODN potentially. So, um, you know, it's going to need to be uh, refreshed. And I think that's key uh, for, for Vorf. But increasingly as well, as, as a product manager, and as it was mentioned, kind of from a user point of view, I'm, I'm very keen that, that actually this becomes, um, you know, a really useful tool and, and something that people can access. And, and so improving that uh, way that people can access that data, uh, whether it be through potentially API access and web services or, or other means, um, that's uh, definitely something to investigate. And also I've put their alternative outputs, but, you know, we looked there, there was the gridded um, uh, data output, but potentially, you know, kind of spot calculations, you know, I just want the calculation in this location. Uh, and can you provide it, that kind of thing, and be able to pull that through easily for users. So I think there's alternative uh, outputs and improved access that we can be doing and looking at uh, as we progress and, and go forward with Vorf. Um, and I think also expanding the coverage. So uh, I briefly mentioned Vorf Global, but this isn't suggesting necessarily uh, global coverage, but certainly looking at expanding that coverage and, and where it would be useful, you know, from a UK uh, government kind of perspective, we obviously have um, uh, overseas territories and, and uh, crown dependencies and such like, um, and, you know, just looking at how the coverage can be expanded uh, to, again, provide the best service uh, for, for users and customers. So that's, um, thank you, that's me uh, done with that. So if there's any questions, I, I know um, uh, David is, is joining us tonight as well. So I'm sure he might be able to answer anything in the chat uh, that I'm not. And I'm also joined by um, Andy Tolbert as well, who is the bathymetry advisor uh, at the UK Hydrographic Office. Um, so if there's any more technical questions, uh, should we say, that probably go over my head, hopefully those guys might be able to, to answer them as well. Thanks, Paul. That was uh, super, super interesting. Thank you. It really was. And, um, Love the picture of your new building as well. That looks um, superb. Very nice. Yes. Yes. Well, um, hopefully, um, I, I believe the intention may be that there, there might be a hydrographic society event uh, at the at the new building. I believe I might be talking out of turn, but uh, I'm certainly hope that that you know. Uh, we got the new building, and then unfortunately COVID came along, didn't it? Um, and so, um, yeah, some 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 events would be nice to get people to kind of come and see our That's new building lovely. and show it off a bit. Well, we look forward to that invitation, and we will be happy yeah. to send a delegation down from Aberdeen <laughs> down to uh, that looks super. Well, um, David is uh, in the chat, and it looks like you owe him a gin and tonic because he's answered one of Walter's questions. <laughs> Um, for you, which was um, about the datum, what uh, what what datum is uh, is you? So thank you, David, for for answering that in the chat. So there was another question from uh, from Walter as well, which was to do with the the early days of your of, of Wharf when there wasn't very much data and um, uh, for, for, um, observations uh, from the coast, and the hydrographic office were looking for data from other sources like oil and gas platforms. And Walter's asking how successful was, uh, was that kind of uh, cry, for, cry for data? Did you get any help? I am, um, hopefully Andy, uh, unfortunately I can't see if Andy has joined uh, the call uh, or not. Uh, Thank you. Yes, yes, you are. You, just you just arrived. <laughs> blocked momentarily by the question popping up. Um, so, um, we, uh, I'm going to apologise because unfortunately I wasn't involved with Walter, so I don't know, Andy, if you're able to um, to, to provide an answer to Walter on on that particular question. Yeah, I'm not um, entirely sure what that's referring to, but um, I think it was probably when uh, we were in that sort of validation phase, and we were looking for as much data as we could to kind of validate forth. I think that's that's what what it was around. Um, so it, it wasn't that it was um less accurate or more accurate than it is now it's, it's it's still the same model um still the same computation from back in 2008 as i say th there was that period of time when we were we we're trying to basically get as much data as we could um tidal data um to 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 prove the model in as many locations as we could um so that was one source i think we were going out out to um i don't think we got a lot of data as far as i know uh in from that uh source 
um but we did get a lot from like the civil hydrography program um anyway okay. you know, we, got, we got a lot of points i think it was over 200 checks or something like that so so we had ample validation you know around okay. uh uk waters anyway so yeah and it did and it took four years so it did take quite a long time anyway okay. yeah okay okay so um my other my question was to go back to the very beginning back in 2005 when um, when ucl started the program it's like what what drove that decision to start the project in the first place was there a commercial drive or or was it purely ucl saying hey let's let's have a closer look at this let's see what we can do let's be smart about this you know what was there was there some external driving force to that project um yeah it, it, it was a concept that it came out of the ukho uh, and uh, basically ucl were kind of commissioned to to, to do the, okay. the, the work for us um and it really it was right around the time i joined um and it was really um about sort of moving into that sort of digital age i think really and, and, and having data that was interoperable and, and, and so on um and we were designing um new sort of digital databases at, at the time which we and we wanted data to be able to be transformable um in the vertical sense um between all the different sort of sources of data that we get because we, we receive data um that sometimes on mean sea level sometimes on land datums um, sometimes on LAT, um, which is like chart datum, but chart datum is a bit of a strange beast in itself. It's, it's very much a hydrographic um, datum uh, that um, it's just an arbitrary picked thing, really. You LAT and then perhaps take a bit more off just to be safe. Um, yeah. so, so it's not often mathematically uh, des defined. Um, so, and, and it's by definition, it's for a chart, it's for that that shape of that chart that, that, that that's what it's originally from but if you're going to go into a digital age where data is going to become more seamless um you know you, you can't have that that uh, you know you need some sort of more common standard uh, and level to, to be able to to transform data vertically um uh from you know all the different sources we're getting so that, that's kind of where it came from um okay. back in back in 2004 when it was being conceived really um and its sort of use now in surveying wasn't really thought of at the time. The fact that you can go out and do a survey um, using GNSS, survey to the ellipsoid, and not worry about a tie gauge, uh, and then transform your data from reference to the ellipsoid to chart datum, you know, later on, that sort of has come about since sort of thing, really, uh, uh, as, as another use, um, because GNSS has got more accurate, basidly and uh, you know, the, ac the accuracy is more um, accessible offshore. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, Damien actually asked another question, which I think David has, ans has answered, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask it again, if that's okay. Um, which was, is the, the S100 IHO initiative intended to be a subscription service? So... So S, the IHO S100 is is uh, a universal hydrographic data model, I believe they, they would call it, um, and really is uh, the IHO putting together a new standards for future navigation, should we say. You know, it, it's, it's a, a model for um, creating standardized data that will be fit for you know kind of future model and and so it's going beyond the current s57 and the electronic navigation charts currently um and it's looking to to broaden you know kind of its scope and coverage so the iho the s100 it itself isn't really a subscription service it is the models and the uh, product specifications and the formats uh or formats the the data standards um to produce data that will be safe for navigation etc you know um the services then that are created uh by hydrographic offices um you know through ranks and, the, and then through the value added resellers um they may be subscription services services um as they are today you know with s57 and and such like so hasn't quite got into that world yet of exactly what the 
um, end service will be uh, mm, from these data like models. It's yeah. still at the moment about, you know, kind of creating uh, the right um, mod data uh, for standards. So there's one for uh, S102 for bathymetric surfaces. Um, there's S104 for, I'm going to get it wrong, but uh, it's tidal. Uh, I forget whether it's the title that's S111, I think is title stream. You know, there's, there's all sorts yeah. that are actually kind of covered. There's S121 for maritime limits, I believe. You know, there, there's all kinds of, of standards now that for for um, standardizing that marine data for navigation. Okay. Well, that kind of leaves it open for a, a part two then, Paul and Andy. You can You can come back and give us an update. Yeah, yeah, up, yeah definitely. Uh, be yeah? A, a, a pleasure to to come back at, at any Good. point and you know and provide or you come with, to Aberdeen. with an update or yeah, come in, come in person to next time um, and, <laughs> and be able to um, to to talk about either an update with Vorf or or any of the other kind of seabed services that I look up to. Be quite happy to to kind of come and, and present again. Um, but also, I'd just like to say, we, you know, whilst I've got you know a group of people here, you know, if anyone has thoughts on on kind of future VORF use, um, you know, they use VORF they, or they want to, or they have some particular kind of uh, need, then you know, please do get in touch uh, with me uh, or, or through David or, or you know through the society at all. Yeah, please do reach out uh, and let me know. Well, perfect. Well, well, thank you both, um, and so by some miracle and good grace of the hydrographic gods we seem to have made it through without any technical hitches that i'm aware of whether we've just been talking to ourselves remains to be seen um but uh can you bring mark back in damien there he is there he is hello mark um sorry i was muted hello it's okay it's okay so I would like to thank um, Paul and Mark um, for their time tonight. Thank you very much. And Andy as well for, for joining us. Really, really interesting. Great to kind of get back to those, those basics and, uh, and, and have, all that, or have all that presented. Um, I'd also like to thank um, our man in the background there working his magic, Damien. Fantastic job. Thank you for keeping us all in check tonight. Um, I'd like to thank our newly elected office bearers and uh, the committee for 2022. Thank you very much. Really, really looking forward to this next year and just hope that we can move from FaceTime to actual FaceTime rather than uh, these digital, this digital time is becoming quite tiresome. Um, so look, I appreciate everybody's time tonight. Um, and unless there's any other comments, that anybody would like to make? Paul, Mark, Andy, anything you'd like to add? No? Uh, okay. No, just thank Super you very much. Yeah, thank well, you. I think we will say then uh, thanks very much to everybody and uh, good night from Aberdeenshire. <laughs>